Webster, and founder of Something Girl Other Publishing, Wade Franson, is the host of Created in the Image of God, a series that examines the role of religion in society. From messianic returns to the emotive responses transmitted through our culture, Wade fearlessly addresses reality claims from all directions, objectively exploring their compatibility with Holy Scripture. Joining him are groundbreaking artist and podcaster, Jacqueline Clare, whose focus on spiritual realism is summarized by the quote, when we don't take the high road with our choices and miss the opportunity to develop spiritual qualities, we literally forfeit the purpose of our lives. And Daniel Sanderson, CEO of Planksit, an international philosophy and cultural media outlet, helping emerging thought leaders with personal branding by co-creating organic content. Tonight's episode, Did I Just Leave a Cult? Wow. Hello, everyone. Well, good evening and welcome to Created in the Image of God, where we bring on a unique guest each week to discuss different aspects of the role of religion and society from very diverse perspectives. And we never know where these conversations will lead. And a reminder to our audience who may be watching live, you can comment, ask questions and engage. We really enjoy having you be a part of the show. So give us a little shout out, say hello, let us know where you're tuning in from and be sure to share your questions. And if we have a good amount of them, we can have a whole segment at the end where we go through some of those. We have a very special guest with us tonight. In addition to Daniel Sanderson, the producer of this show, we have Sasha Stone, who is joining us by voice, but she has amazing podcasts and blog, and it will be featured on the screen the whole time, so there's no excuse for not finding it. Sasha Stone is an independent thinker and writer who strives for a truthful take on politics, culture, and media on her nonpartisan blog, Free Thinking Through the Fourth Turning with Sasha Stone, a rumination on the collapse of culture on the left. Is it really that bad? Yes, it is really that bad. <laughs> she landed on the radar of the show with her viral blog, Did I Just Leave a Cult? Where she outlines the progression from the anti-God disintegration of the hippie era of her upbringing to the fervor of self-help culture and liberal activism to her personal awakening to the lies and corruption of the so-called legacy or mainstream media and culture. We are very excited to talk with her about her journey thus far and hear her views on the cultural road ahead. Sasha, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Yes, well, we're real excited to have you, as I said. And first off, if you could just help the audience here get to know you a little bit, you know, I mentioned briefly the cultural milieu of your upbringing, but maybe if you could share a little bit more of those early experiences that that shaped you and set you up for who you are today. Mm. Well, um, I grew up as a kind of a, a um a hippie in the 60s in Topanga Canyon, a very sort of chaotic upbringing. Uh, uh, with my mother, who was a, um, she was a kind of a queen in the valley. Her parents, her, she, they came from the south. They were actually sort of extended of the Lee clan, Robert E. Lee, but not directly related to Robert E. Lee, but, you know, close enough. And um, they all moved to California when she was just a little girl. And she was beautiful. And she... Um, was entering beauty pageants and going to high school. And then she got pregnant with my brother at about 16. She dropped out to raise him. And then she was working as a cocktail waitress in Hollywood. And she met my father who was a jazz drummer. And they had three more kids uh, one year apart. That was, and I was right in the middle with my older sister, my younger sister. So now she had four kids under the age of, I mean, before she hit 25. And wow. um, and then my father left. And so she was a single mother back in the 60s, raising us um, in the mountains of Topanga. And, you know, she my mother's an atheist and, you know, really staunchly anti-religion. And so I grew up with a very pragmatic, skeptical mind, asking a lot of questions, honestly, throughout my entire young life. Why am I here? Who 
who am I? What am I? You know, and um, and then that curiosity is taking me down many different roads to to sort of learn everything that I can about um, various things uh, in you know not not so much spirituality, but just trying to understand. Um, you know, my place in the world, what, what, what was, what was wrong with me? You know, I, I really did believe all the lies of the left and the Democrats and the feminist movement. I bought into all of it and, th and thought that self-fulfillment could really take me through. And um, now here I am, uh, my daughter's moved out and she lives in Ohio with her boyfriend. And um, I, it's just me. I'm alone and with my thoughts once again. You know, when you have a kid, you can kind of distract yourself um, and just, you know, invest all of your time. Just a quick warning. My dogs are here and somebody is about to drop a package off. So they're going to start barking. So I just wanted to give you a warning. It won't last long. But just FYI, you're going to hear some dogs barking in a minute. Um, so you're saying that's an active dog. <laughs> an active dog. <laughs> Unexpected active dog. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so that's really you know, kind of where I'm coming from, uh, spiritually and such. Um, I, uh, I have a much longer story about how I ended up writing this sub stack and, and, you know, what my political beliefs are and, and why, why I'm actually trying to speak out and reach more people with my, um, my opinions. But really that's sort of the, I mean, I'm, you know, bounced around city colleges, went to um, a university, graduated at the age of, I was the first person in my family to graduate college at the age of 29, which took me a while, but I was very proud of that. And um, they weren't indoctrination factories like they are now. And the only thing that ever really grounded me in any sort of substance was a human action class I took, which gave me some answers to, to a lot of the questions that I had about myself and about my body and, you know, my instincts and really, you know, just mortality, you know, things that I, I ruminate on a lot. And mm -hmm. um, the piece, you know, the piece you're talking about just sort of was a moment where it all sort kind of came full circle for me. And I, and I could see it from the expanse of old age and looking back on my life. Yeah, it's so interesting. And you've sparked so many questions for me. But a real simple one for this introduction part of the show. And I think part of your answer is probably going to be that your upbringing raised you to ask questions and to investigate things. But, you know, from this sort of hippie milieu and this like California milieu and you're an artist and took a creative path and um, the anti-God aspect and the, the liberal activism. How, like, is there something maybe even in your upbringing, maybe you developed it later, what was it that allowed you to break away? There they go, the act of dog, yeah, I hear them. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's, mine's walking around too, and she sounds like she has high heels on in the hard, <laughs> hardwood floor. Um, uh. but, but essentially what I'm getting at is you have all the trappings of somebody who's like on a certain extreme of the political side, really just because you're like Californian and creative and all of this stuff. And like, what was it that prepared you or enabled you to be able to step outside of what was probably your whole world and, and your friends growing up, et cetera? Mm. Well, it was a slow, long, slow slide actually for me because I spend a lot of my time online and around 2015, you know, I mostly write about film. I've, I've only been somebody writes about film, but you know, I'm an internet person of internet culture. And so I have a lot of communities built up on various uh websites so facebook instagram twitter and um and my website and people knew me these various sides of my personality well in and i was never political until 2015 when i read i was writing a science fiction book and i and i read as many books on the future as i could find by scientists and they all had these dire warnings about climate change and to, to such an extent that I thought I had to, my, it was my civic duty to, to throw myself into the race and make sure Hillary Clinton won. And I didn't, it didn't matter if it was her, it could have been any Democrat, but from 2015 on through to the election, I was, I became known as a very prominent Hillary Clinton supporter and advocate. And 
so much so that I was put on a list of most hated on Twitter and I was followed by a lot of very important people in the Democratic Party. And, um, and Trump won. I noticed something really strange happening to my side, to, to the Democrats and to people on the left. Sorry about that banging. I'm not sure what that is. Um, and I, I, what I noticed was that something, some foundation had been shaken. Some sort of um, certainty ha had been disrupted in what we thought our world was. And, and suddenly had to share it with people that were very different from us that we had long, we, we thought we left long behind um, as we built this new society online, you know? Um, and I think it's such a, it was such a traumatic experience for so many people on the left that I think it kicked into a kind of mass hysteria, a reaction to Trump. And, and so I started to notice these things um, like pushing out Al Franken, for instance, from the Senate and the way that they were behaving around movies and the Oscar race and cancel culture started to happen. And then I started getting attacked by people that I knew for various things. And so I started to, you know, think about what is going on? You know, what is this? What's happening? And I, I was still loyal to my tribe all the way up to the 2020 election. But in the summer of 2020, for me, everything changed. Because that was when I realized that there was something much bigger than just politics and just my own perception and, and just hysteria on, on my side. I, I noticed because that of how I just want to ask because how the media um, covered for the destruction of the, yeah. the protest. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was mainly that. Well, because we'd been locked down. Uh, you know, my daughter had had to give up her graduation. My only daughter graduating from NYU and come home and live with me and, and people were missing funerals and weddings and we were doing all that. And then all of a sudden there were these protests and it was as though there wasn't, it was all imaginary. We, we never had to lock down. And then of course, after that, we, we, we locked down again, but yeah. I, and I noticed that Tom Cotton had written an essay that reflected the American people's idea that if, if the can't be controlled, military has to be brought in. And I watched all of my friends on Twitter saying, you know, you can't say that the New York Times, you can't post that, that's irresponsible, you're going to cause people to die, you know. And, and um, I started to stand up against that. And I just said, what are you doing? You know, what are you, you're, you're going to tell the New York Times that they can't publish an op-ed from a United States senator. And then so from then on, I just sort of just tried to, to figure out, okay, so what else don't you know? And that's when I wandered into the world of the right and Trump supporters and got to know them and, and watched his rallies and, you know, tried to open my mind up to, to this side of America that I really didn't know. And of course I found it's out so that, it was, you know, sorry, uh, just last thing, yeah. uh, just, and then of course I found out that almost everything that we thought was true wasn't true. Yeah, it's definitely a journey of seeking the truth and also uh, being willing to humanize what you might have seen as the other side at one point. Um, we have one last question before we cut to a quick commercial break. Sasha, if there was one thing, this is like a fun question. If there was one thing that if everyone could just do some adjustment or change if everyone in the world would just do this thing, it would make the world a better place. What would it be? Um, it would be give people the benefit of the doubt. Don't always assume that this person is a bad person or a racist or whatever it is, you know, and, and don't assume they're guilty just because they've been accused of something. Take the time to humanize them, take a breath and, you know, say, look, I'm going to assume this person has the best of intentions. Beautiful. All right. <laughs> we'll be right back after this break. And welcome to Something or Other Publishing, or as our friends like to call us, Soup. Soup is a platform that connects authors, readers, and service providers in one convenient place. Choose Soup if you're an author with a great book idea and you're looking for a publisher offering hands-on coaching in some of the best royalties in the business. Or if you're a reader who enjoys engaging with celebrated and emerging authors, we already have over 3,000 of them, and more are joining every day. 
You can even win free books by voting on their book ideas. Or maybe you're a service provider and you're looking to engage with over 3,000 authors. We're here to help. So whether you're an author, a reader, or a service provider, you're in the right place at Soup. Contact us at help at soupllc.com to learn more. So, Sasha, your podcast, the one we're referring to here um, about the fourth turning, can you explain what that means, the whole premise of your, the frame of your podcast? Yeah, the so the fourth turning is based on the book um, by Neil Howe uh, and William Strauss, who's who's. Uh, it's just Neil Howe is the only one of those two who's alive now, and he he's about to come out with an update on on his book that he wrote in two thousand seven, believe it or not. Um, which is, you know, if you read the fourth turning, you'll see how eerily uh, accurate it was uh, to predict the future, just based on patterns of the past. And according to him and according to other people who have looked at different sort of pendulum um, theories, the fourth turning is, is if you think of these turnings as seasons, the fourth turning is winter. So it's, it's the worst time. It's the time of the Civil War. It's the time of the American Revolution. It's the time of World War II. It's major uh, foundational breakdowns in the country and a, a rebuilding of a new America. And you know, I only know one person who is uh, aware that we're in a fourth turning and is actively trying to sort of game the system, trying to make it more about the people in a populist revolution rather than what it looks like it's it's going to be, which is something dystopian, you know, a sort of an AI controlled totalitarian state, which nobody really wants, but um getting through this moment is going to be rough. And so I thought it's going to last a while. I might as well just sort of dive in and comment on what I'm seeing um, if I can help in any way. But it's, it's a really interesting book. I mean, if you read it, you'll see that the visions of a fourth turning are quite apocalyptic. <laughs> so, but he does make mm -hmm. the point of saying that it could go either way. You know, it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, nuclear war. But it's not surprising, and I wrote on, on my, my, uh, my sub stack, I think two years ago, I said, talking about the fourth turning, I said, you know, it's either going to be something like war with Russia or, and I, at the time that I was writing it, I thought, that's ridiculous, you know, it's never going to happen. And, um, and here we are, you know, we're close to it now. So uh, I, think, I think that, hum you know, we just sort of don't want to think about the bad things that could happen. And I think that's right. I mean, you can't, depress yourself thinking about all the things you can't really control. But I just thought it would be a good place to, to position myself to sort of analyze what was going on. Yeah, to narrate it and, and call it while it's happening. Mm. Um, Sabrina Lommer asks, are we still in the crisis phase? And it sounds like we are. <laughs> Is that right? Well, according to Neil Howe, and I don't, you know, um, I, I can't wait to read his updated version, although I have heard him talk a little bit about this fourth turning and I'm not sure we are simpatico about it, but it is his theory. So, you know, I can't really, I, it, he called the crisis point 2008, which was the financial meltdown and the, um, uh, you know, the, the formation of Occupy Wall Street and Tea Party. What he, what he said was the crisis would spark the fourth turning. That was the beginning of it. And what that did, if you look back, is it really did sort of start distrust of government um, a breakdown of institutions. And then, you know, you see these uprisings from the public and, and, you know, our government really only wants to demonize one group. And that was the January 6 people. But if you look around, you can, it's, it's, they're hardly the only ones. Lots of different groups have been rising up against the government since then for different reasons. And it's, it's a really interesting thing. I'm not sure exactly what moment we're in, but he says we're, when we're through it, it'll be around the year 2030. <laughs> so it's going to be a while. Um, right. And, and hopefully, as you said, there'll be a, a new America or new world in terms of like a, a flourishing. I hope we like, like winter, you know, you lose the old leaves and then spring comes. So mm -hmm. hopefully that's what's in store for us. Yeah. 
That's exactly how he describes it. He says, you know, winter isn't just isn't bad. It's necessary to sort of and you can see right. the end of the boomers, right? We're, we're living out the last gasp of the very dominant, very influential generation of the baby boomers. And this is it. This is their last gasp. And the new America will be dominated by millennials and Generation Z and whatever's coming after that. And so the world they make is going to be a world that they want and that they like, not a world that we're all trying to hold on to. Um, but, you know, it is going to be a fight because, you know, where they want to take this country right now, I think, is, is where a lot of people don't really want to go. Right, right. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions about spirituality. And in your blog post, you talked about um, it, or when you mentioned it here with us, how you're parents generation was vehemently anti God. Um, yet you sort of outline how humans have a way of replacing that, that, that worship of an idea with something, right. And it becomes, it becomes, you know, a hippie lifestyle or it becomes a certain savior or politician or so forth. And I just wanted to see if you'd thought any more about like that aspect of your, that world that you grew up in that you outline in that did I just join a cult, how it went from the hippie thing to then your generation that was like Oprah and self-help and like a very hyper self-focus in this effort to like fix things. If like what you feel the role of spirituality played in that or the hunger for spirituality or religion in that evolution. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Because we're living through a time where there are more people alive than ever before who are connected with each other uh, than ever before. And in times like that, human beings were not built for chaos. We're built for structure. We're built for tradition. We're built for generations teaching us things, learning lessons. Um, but we just don't have that kind of way of life anymore. We, we have chaos. And so I think that a lot of the starting now is a way of people trying to make order of that chaos. But even before that happened, before the internet, um, I, I see it because of the fourth turning and because of looking at generations and patterns of the past, I see that, you know, America was and still is majority Christian. So, but back before the sixties, it was probably like 90%, something like that. Um, now I think it's like 70% maybe it's still the majority, but it's, it's not where it was and um, people are losing faith. But, but that was the moment when coming out of the 1950s, which was the calm that came after the last fourth turning of the, the world war two and McCarthyism. And, you know, Eisenhower was the great champion who kind of smoothed things out, you know, installed the interstates all over the country I mean, he was a great man. It would just be amazing if we could have a leader like that. Um, but, you know, he made sort of in this normal veneer, this Americana, you know, but it was covering a sort of simmering unrest. And little by little, just like now, you had the civil rights movement, you had the feminist movement back then, the gay rights movement. And what they saw as in their way was religion. Religion had its grips on um, film and, and pop culture and science and everything like it like it does now. But it's it's the left version of it. Um, but back then, what they wanted was to break free from it. But they did it in a way without realizing that when you empty yourself out like that, you have to then fill yourself back up again. And that was the hard part for the people. So that's why you had cults and you had this celebrity and you had rock concerts and you know and eventually it turned into the self-help industry and consumerist culture you know what can i buy how can i improve my life um, how can i fill myself back up from this empty space that i have inside and you know if you're lucky you find religion i i, I started listening to the bible in a in a year um podcast uh with father mike and and I, you know, I've gotten so much out just reading the Bible itself because it's such an interesting piece of literature. Um, and, you know, I'm slowly working my way in that direction. I'm not there yet, but I wish that I had better. And I, I, you know, I wish I had just taken my daughter to church, for instance, and just gave her that, even if she wanted to reject it. 
I wish I would have just said, here's your foundation. This is what you're going to need. This is what you turn to in times of stress instead of antidepressants, instead of TikTok, you know, here's this, this will fill you up. And I think we're facing you know, a that, crisis. Sorry, I'm just going on and on. Just no, please, <laughs> no, please, please, no, please. No. We're facing a crisis. That sounds very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I'm just saying that it. It. Um, um, I'm just reading here the comments that people are asking about the fourth turning. I don't know if you want me to answer any of those, but. Um, and, and I know Daniel has a question too. Um, I, I still, I'm still going to hold on to the mic for just a second. Um, and you started to go there. I was just wanted to ask you, cause you mentioned like the self-help culture and rock concerts and this progression and how you see that hunger uh, expressed now. And you mentioned TikTok, antidepressants, like what do you see as the ways people are probably improperly filling that uh, that need now. Yeah, exactly like that. And I think that, you know, that in some ways that's good for American capitalism. It's good for consumer culture because, you know, people always, but you know, Oprah every day at three o'clock for my generation of women of, of the Hillary Democrat, the feminist types, you know, that was sort of our church, even though she is a very religious person. So she didn't really, she didn't replace her own faith with, with, herself right but but it was that culture of you know i can be better i can be better i can raise my kids to be perfect i can be per perfect if i do this and i do that and i you know i i practice yoga and i you know i have the right diet or you know i'm going to fix everything about the world but missing is that core faith that i think all humans most humans even even atheists, you know, I think that there is a, it's there with everybody because it's bred into us. You know, it's passed down through generations. It just takes one form or another. Either you reject it and you have a curious mind and you, you know, you, you ask questions that you can't get fulfillment or, or, or you just give yourself over to faith. And I find people who do that tend to be the happier people. Honestly. Mm, interesting. Daniel, please. I was curious, Sasha, about the your take on whether or not this um uh the, this formation of the left was more of an emergent property um or was it more of intentionally uh just bad actors um yeah trying to set do you know what i'm trying to ask i i have thought that more than once this is this is the crazy conspiracy theory i thought of today if you wanted to wipe i don't know if this is this where you're going but i just say if you wanted to wipe out america if you wanted to destroy this country all you have to do is you know hit us on our population so you know look i'm not saying i believe this i'm saying it it entered my mind at one point i'm not i'm mm -hmm. not sitting here spouting this as a conspiracy theory i'm just saying that how easy, you know, how easy it would be to uh, make us not want to reproduce, for instance, uh, not want to reproduce, to sterilize our young, um, to take away the foundations of, of male and female, you know, and, and erase love thy neighbor. Um, do I think it was, I think what happened, my own personal opinion is that right around 2012, uh, when the Tea Party rose up and obstructed Obama, I think that Obama had become sort of a godlike figure to us and that when they obstructed him, we thought it was racism. We thought that they were obstructing him because he was black. And um, and that kicked in this sort of desire to uh, teach racism to young people so that we could eradicate it. I know that on my own site, I was writing a lot around this time, 2013, 2014, about you know trying to change the oscar race to not be so white and to you know sort of base my writing on critical race and gender theory and my daughter went to a school that taught critical race theory and i think that i think it started there but then what ended up happening was because white people are the majority they it was too hard for them to just all of them admit that they were the oppressors and that they started to develop this strange new way of thinking of themselves to transition out of being these terrible people to, to become trans or to become, you know, LGBT or to, to somehow identify outside of the norm. 
Um, and, and I think it just spread. You know, people had protection if they were in one of these groups. And if they didn't, they were attacked. And I think that's how it, it all spread online and in college campuses. And eventually now they've all grown up and matriculating into our into our world. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, it's definitely sparking a lot for a lot of people. And Sasha, you're very good at uh, articulating these phenomena, you know, like, and that's why it's so resonant, because like, we, we know what you're saying is is true or mirrors some of our experience, but you have a way of saying it where it's like, yes, you know, like a great stand up <laughs> comedian, that's what you love. Oh. they like make you laugh, because they like say the truth. And you're like, yes, I've thought that, you know, oh, um, thank you. Wade mentioned that the uh, self-loathing was introduced to the I guess, predominant culture. Um, it's like, well, we can at least hate ourselves, right? We can, mm -hmm. we can chop ourselves up or, or highlight, you know, things that we find whatever strange about us. It's weird because there's no normal person, you know, like we're all so, there is no majority. We're all individuals with all kinds of quirks and histories and that sort of thing. But we have exaggerated, uh, everything that makes us different and sort of taken it as some sort of crown or as you put some sort of escape from reproach, right? Like, don't be mad at me. I'm, you know, gay yeah, or I'm trans or, or, you know, or I'm an ally. And that's something you mentioned in that same, did I just leave a cult blog uh, and podcast about now we have this culture of allyship and it's, it's also a cloak of, safety it also fills this void of meaning and this allyship can take very strange forms like parents who you know support their very young children in gender mutilation and you know transitioning and and i wanted your thoughts on on allyship but specifically the dark aspect of like virtue signaling and when it is dark and like why do you think people have this need to virtue signal like why do they so badly want to project that they're empathetic or good at, at sometimes the expense of their children of their society mm. do you have any thoughts about that yeah i mean that's a sad thing for me to see and you know i will admit to having been a part of it until you know recently with riley Gaines talking about swimming and sports and i thought what I, my instinct here is to say stay quiet and to not say anything because i know that i'm going to get viciously attacked i might even lose my business but you know there is a there is a logic here that has to, a hard line um and i was listening to these other podcasters um Brett Weinstein and Heather Hying talking today about Dylan Mulvaney, and they were very specifically using the he pronoun. And I thought I could never do that. I could never just blatantly use that um, because, uh, you know, it's it for me, it's not very, I don't have any more virtue signaling clout laugh. Like <laughs> that's gone. Nobody's going to give it to me. So, but I, but I, I am still afraid of, re, re, of repercussions. Um, Hollywood is very much a very, sort of punitive place and they will try to destroy you if they see you as as uh as an enemy and you know while i'm kind of ready to do that i i am starting to speak out more because i think it's more important to speak out i think all of this is going to backfire in about 10 years all of this stuff, chickens are going to come home to roost and they're all the kids are going to be saying why didn't you protect us how could you have let this go on and everybody will start you know taking you know stock of who did what and who said what and who wrote what and all that history is going to be laid out but there's one thing to really keep in mind as we head into this new phase of american life is just as the printing press really changed human civilization the internet has changed it so much that we're, we're really in uncharted territory because i'm an internet immigrant i had half my life in real life and half my life online and 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 as i'm online I learned that I can live as avatar. I can be anybody I want to be online. Um, and, and I think kids who are internet uh, natives grow up with this idea of I have an alternate self. 
that is my alternate online self. And I think all this, a lot of this stuff is coming up as they are redefining and reshaping that version of themselves. And then they want to turn their earthly bodies into that self that they've created online, this persona. But what we're missing is leadership. We're missing, you know, foundation. We're missing community. Um, and, and, and all that is because we're just in this weird technology where people cannot feel their feet on the ground anymore, you know? Mm -hmm. Basically said. Yeah. Um, looks like we're going to jump to a commercial break. And then I have a question that I must get out before, before Wade and, and Daniel, Wade might be joining us. So anyway, it looks like <laughs> we're going to a commercial break and we'll be right back. All right. Your story has the power to start a movement. Journalism is more than a tool for broadcasting news. It's an important way of fostering meaningful cultural relationships that create tangible change in our society. With our anthology Cultural Journalism, you can now do your part and make your mark. From expert writers to passionate amateur, everyone has a story to tell. Our aim is to promote equality, empathy, and create a safe space for different perspectives and interpretations of the world around us. Come join us today and break free from the toxic new cycle. By submitting your story to cultural journalism at info at superllc.com. Welcome back. Sasha, I know that you, a lot of your internet uh, life uh, centered around tracking the race to the Academy Awards, to the Oscars. And mm -hmm. so you've really analyzed consensus and, and culture. And your podcast that we've been referring to mentions the collapse of culture. Is it really that bad? Yes, it's really that bad. <laughs> so I wanted to, given your experience and your perspective, like, what do you mean? Where are we headed based on your piecing together of the puzzle and your background in doing this? Like, what do you mean about that as far as our culture? Well, you know, I, one of the ways that I escaped in my life as a kid was I lived inside of movies. Movies were and are my life. I, as you can see, I, I post, you know, links to, to clips from films. And I think in terms of movie quotes, a lot of people of my generation are the same way. You know, I just, I grew up going to the drive-in, and I, a lot of times I learned a lot of my life, life's lessons through film and art. And I searched, I, you know, I turned to that because it gave me a broader understanding. I would love like reading a book that would just open up my mind to things I knew nothing about. And movies were the same way. And, um, but that's changed now because what you're getting isn't uh, any kind of good storytelling anymore. Like, I don't even know if the people who write movies anymore, like live in real life, like to have stories to tell. <laughs> I mean, they've, they've cut themselves off from real life. So, mm -hmm. and so when I watch them now, I see them trying to tell me how I should feel, how I should think, shaming me for what I want, you know, what kind of a character I want, what kind of a story I want. No, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this because that's what society needs. And then in my field, in the Oscars, you know, even when I was championing women and people of color to win, I always knew it about because they deserve it. You know, like they gave the best performance or the, but now it's, it's, that's changed. They don't even, they've skipped that part. Now it's just about identity. It's just about, they deserve it because they are, you know, Asian, the first Asian person to win or. Um, this woman deserves it because she's a she's a uh, the only female nominated in the category, and I think it's just really sort of bottomed out the Oscars. Like I think people watch them and they think, "Come on, this isn't <laughs> this isn't real anymore." Like, what are you doing? It's just this, this idea of fixing society. You know, they they want to be good. They want to be good Puritans and and make you know make make their contributions have some meaning. But I mean, for me, it's it's pretty much just sort of destroyed it as as any way that I could, uh, you know, turn to or find some illumination of the human experience in anymore. They don't do that. They don't think in terms of telling stories for everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You comment in your podcast about a lot of cultural events, you know, like it, how you awaken to the legacy media, not giving the full story and, and telling you how to feel about things, 
and being um you had one about like how i knew they were lying about january 6th like you comment on a lot of very hot relevant current event topics as well as the arts is that is that the extent to what you mean when you say the collapse of culture are you really talking about the collapse of the the arts you know and and creative culture or do you have more of a forecast for our whole society i guess that would be the word i'm searching for well i would have no yeah for sure i mean we i think we are heading for some I think everybody can feel it. We're heading for something. We know Biden can't really hold this thing together. And we have Trump on the other side. We have all this simmering sort of tension between the two sides and with no leadership anywhere. And so we are, I think, in a very sort of perilous moment. Um, what's happened on the left is that they, you know, they used to be the counterculture and conservatives, conservatives pretty much, um, uh, sort of dominated even culture back uh, in the 40s and and through the 50s. And then in the 60s, they went their separate ways. You know, the, the conservatives stayed in control of government for the most part. Democrats, you know, lost ground. Uh, they had Congress, but they, you know, Jimmy Carter and everything. And then Ronald Reagan took power in 1980 and he his administration reigned for uh, 12 years, which was my basically my entire life coming of age was with Republicans in power. and left control and culture. So they were some, you know, they were the anti-establishment. They were the counterculture. But after Obama, they kind of fused again because Obama was a culture guy too. And so his influence brought politics and culture together. And that really has been a killer for the left in terms of being able to, to be, to create art because now they're part of the establishment. And so, you know, you see these movie stars who are part of the democratic party, the media is all part of it. It's all this one sort of fascist like uh, monopoly on culture and politics and media. And then you have the counterculture on the right. And so the reason that I write more sympathetic to the to the right side and not the left side anymore is that I've given up on the left. They're done. What has to happen is they have to be completely defeated and the whole house of cards has to come down. And then they can slowly build themselves back up again. But all the new grass is growing on the right. It's all starting over there. That's where the counterculture is. That's where all this, this, you know, sort of energy is. It's all happening on the right. And so that's why I tend to be a little bit more interested in it. Um, as far as collapse, I mean, look, I, I, I trust in the, in the fourth turning. I trust, like, I just don't know where it's going to go. I don't know if we're talking world war. We're not talking civil war because they're not two equal sides like they were back in the 1860s or whenever it was the civil war. And so we have one empire and we have one resistance on the right. So it's not going to be any sort of hot war. I don't think in this country, unless they try to say, take away guns or, um, but, but I don't I really foresee that happening. I, I think it's more like we're just going to see a lot of, energy moving to the right people more interested in what people on the right have to say watching more news watching more comedy you know and and, and sort of escaping the left just like i did and so that's sort of where i see it all going um is it collapsing yeah i mean i think that we're absolutely in a foundational collapse if, if we have children who are being sterilized by clinics and, and nobody's saying anything about it like you're sterilizing a 13 year old who can never have children again and that's okay like that we're really living through that right now um so yeah i think i think that, that they need a huge wake-up call mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um why it, is it important to you to narrate this fourth turning especially when it's you know probably upset some of your family and friends and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I have to tell you, I, I wake up sort of gripped by fear every single day. <laughs> I mean, it's not a really fun place to be. Um, I, I am always afraid wow. that, that someone, something bad is going to happen. Someone's gonna, you know, I'm going to lose everything somehow. And, um, but I, you know, I just feel compelled to do it. I feel compelled to speak. I feel compelled to, write and communicate outwardly and i don't really know why that i feel compelled to do it but i just do 
And so, you know, I have thoughts and I have essays in my head and I have things that I want to say to people and have them listen. And honestly, this little blog that I have on Substack is, is you know, way more high profile than my uh, writing about film was because film is such a, it's sort of a dying industry. And I think people are looking for what they call in the fourth turning um, alpha voices, which are people who are courageous enough to speak out at a t time when everybody's afraid. And so that's sort of where I see my role is like, I'm not going to try to, I'm not going to be silent and try to get along. I'm going to try to be disruptive um, and loud. What advice would you have for someone who might be listening to this, who maybe hasn't made it fully to where you are yet? Like maybe they're hearing you. They think she sounds intelligent. I'm not like totally sure what she's talking about as far as like the media or culture, but I feel like there's something to it, but I don't even know where to start. Like, um, so what would you say to that person as far as like, how do they progress on this journey to be more of a free thinker and not just having the thoughts that are inserted by the media culture around them? Well, I'll tell you, it's really hard for me. I didn't even know I was in a bubble. And I, when I, when I realized I was, I had to completely shut off all incoming from MSNBC, from the New York times, uh, from NPR, from my Twitter feed, I had to completely cut it out. And I said, okay, I'm only going to watch conservative news. I'm only going to watch stuff on the right to see things from clearly from both sides. Now I want to see the perspective of people on the right. Cause I know basically everybody is, you know, we're all human beings. Everybody in, you know, does battle with good and evil every day. They're not, they're not monsters, you know, on the other side. Um, and so I did that, but it wasn't easy. And even now, you know, I, I dip back into the left occasionally, but I, I'll never get myself in a bubble, whether it's on the left or the right anymore. I try to, to go back and forth and to, to see what's true, to find of any story. What's the truth of this, the real truth, even if it's uncomfortable, because you can get caught up in these things where people tell you what you want to hear. And I see that on the right a lot. And I think, you you know, they're heading down the wrong road with that because it satisfies their audience, but it's not necessarily the truth. And so there's going to be a rude awakening on down the road. But I guess I would just say that, you know, if it doesn't bother you, there's not really anything you, you, you need to do or you should do. Um, only thing that I, I knew for a fact was that I was part of a group that was dehumanizing another group. And I knew that was wrong. I knew it was wrong. And so I had to do something about it. And so if you find yourself part of one group dehumanizing another group, I'd say just take the time to think about that and think about what you're participating in, you know. That's good. And you mentioned on one of your podcasts that about the difference between searching for the truth or expressing the truth rather than just wanting to win, right? Like it's not about just having a triumph of your perspective or your hope or expectation but actually wanting to know what is true yeah and again that's not easy because you know that on the left they're really educated people and they have a lot of technology and a lot of power and they're very good at negotiating the truth no matter what it is whether it's um uh gender affirming care uh whatever it is they've always got something they can drag out and some cystic they can tell you and to win that argument um but common sense i think is a better barometer personally common sense will take you very far because you know deep down what's true you know you just have to trust yourself mm -hmm. that's very good um somebody did ask if this is the death of free speech what do you think about that um i i don't think it's the death of free speech because we have all of these brave fighters you know <laughs> on the who are pushing back and speaking loudly really what happened i figure in my next piece that i'm writing is about or one of them is about the 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 idea that the biggest threat to the left in 2016 wasn't anything donald trump did it wasn't any action he took or it was nothing he was threatening to do. It was what he said.
because they we had become such a um a closely monitored culture where we watched every single word we said and so as not to offend and offending somebody on the left was blasphemy by the time he took power and so it, you know it was re my what i came out of all of it after all this time seven years is that we're either a country that can live with someone saying things that we don't like or we're not you know and if if donald trump says something and people shrug and just move on with their lives then you know we will have passed through this moment if the things he said still sends them into days and days of waves of hysteria then you know we're not through it um I don't think it's the death of it. I just think it's 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 moment has, you know, we're we're, we're doing battle with it right now, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, I've been monitoring this cultural moment for a while, pretty closely. And uh, 2016 was also when I started paying attention. And I went from being like the girl who would go up to people in their cars when they were idling, you know, and I'll like knock on their window and be like, <laughs> it's bad for the environment. You shouldn't be idling your car. Like people oh. I've never met, you know, and, and any space I was in, like I was the one like rallying for, for the recycling bins. And I'm not, and I'm not um, saying that we shouldn't care about those things, but I'm saying I went from being, you know, that much in people's faces about things to starting to realize like, hey, I'm I'm actually not on board with what the mainstream is pushing. And I lived in LA at the time and I saw, you know, people in, in my social environment who were like all about art and love and all this stuff become very ugly and angry when yeah. they talked about certain topics and it was like such a change you know mm. um so it has been a very interesting several years and somewhat alienating but you know there was something about listening to some of your podcasts because you do such a good job of putting together sound bites from different news outlets and stuff and it actually scared me and it's not and the weird thing is nothing that I heard wasn't stuff I already kind of knew, but hearing it, just the audio version in little snippets and composites in the, the narratives you were telling about, you know, J6 or whatever it was, it, it sounded like, like basically news clips sounded like villains in movies. You know, it sounded like something some dystopian world or it sounded like Nazi Germany, like just the the brazen malice and dishonesty. And so that's why I was asking about the collapse of culture. Like, I feel like we're in this like bad movie about the collapse <laughs> of something. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know what you're talking about. And I say I'm a person with extreme empathy. Like it's so bad with me that like, I can't even cut, leaves off of a basil plant without feeling bad if i see like a stuffed animal thrown away in the trash it makes me sad and like i know that that's my yeah. problem but it was i i got a kind of ptsd during that watch just like what you're talking about watching these people that i thought was the good guys you know i thought we were the side that was nice and humane and kind and turn into just you know, full of hate. And and when that happened, I understood for the first time how these things happen in our history. How could people go along with things? Well, that's how. There you go. And um, and I, I, you know, it really did bother me. And it, it still does. They they think, you know, they, they act as though they're on the right side. But the hatred, you know, the hatred and the uh, treating their fellow Americans that um, like garbage. You know, and it, it really did and still does bother me. And and if they w hadn't acted like that, I don't even know if I ever would have gone through any of the shifts that I, I went through. But I know now that I will never be a part of anything like that again. Um, and it, it's still going on. And I, 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 I write it that way because I, I'm hoping that people from my side find their way in and can hear what they sound like and can see from the other side what, what it is that they're doing because they, they don't, they cast themselves always as the good guys. And so that, you know, that compels me too to sort of reach them, um, even though it does, it isn't working. <laughs> like they just come to me and start screaming at me, you know, but. Um... 
Well, good for you for trying because that's really what need, what's needed. And I think Daniel will very much agree. Like mm. people have to be able to cross over in perspectives, you know, because um, it's valuable to know who your, your people are who already see what you see. And that's really important. But it does seem like to shift the dial, you have mm. to be reaching at least little bits of other people, uh, you know, from the other side. I don't like using that phrase. Yeah. But people who did not see and now they see a little bit thanks to you. Daniel, do you want to jump in? I'm yeah, sure you I, do. I, I come at this a little bit differently. I think maybe on the on the on the arc of uh, progressive versus conservative, I think I'm uh, a little bit more of, of um, somebody that's um, hanging on a little bit, right? So that resonates when I'm I'm listening that there there might be um, tidbits or bits of wisdom as a philosopher. If I'm hearing something that that um, I, I could take away from you that will um, move me a little bit closer to uh, some wisdom or I, I don't really want to say truth so much, but wisdom is something that I, I kind of really relate with, right? Um, and I wanted to ask you about, um, you brought up a couple of people's names who I, um, I, I trust and I think they, they really represent a, a progressive uh, position, uh, a reasonable progressive position, and that would be Heather and uh, Hang and, and, and Brett Weinstein. Hmm. So I'm curious about what your take is on their version of uh, progressive politics, what your thoughts were about um, their position on, on COVID, lab leak, how much do you know how much do you pay attention to what they say? And what are, what are your thoughts about uh, the Dark Horse podcast? Well, I, I love them because I, you know, I found Brett Weinstein through the Evergreen thing and I started following him and his brother as well. His brother is incredibly, uh, Eric Weinstein is brilliant. Weinstein, I think is how you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. And then I got to know Heather Hying, who I probably like even more. <laughs> um, yeah because she's just so smart and the things she writes are so smart. I, I always, I don't always watch their show anymore. I used to during, you know, the, the but I, I find that they have a great way of um, expanding my own thinking about every subject. If I listen to them, they're thoughtful, they're kind. They're definitely not political, particularly of one side or the other. They are progressives, as you say, but, uh, I liked his idea of uh, the unity party that they wanted oh, yeah. uh, to do years great. ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they and they banned him off of Facebook for that because they thought it was inter election interference. Um, but I, you know, I yeah. like that. Yeah. I like people who are, you know, carving a path out. He calls it the duopoly. Brett Weinstein does, mm -hmm. and you know, I like that. Like, I'm I'm definitely not partisan at this point. I, I like people who are asking questions. Yeah, I find them, um, they were way ahead on the vaccine information. You know, I listened to Naomi Wolf as well on that, on the Steve Bannon's podcast. You know, I, was, I did take the vaccine. I was, you know, an extra person, but I, I definitely listened intently in how they were trying to get out the truth that our government was so intent on shutting down and that was so dangerous. Um, you know, I, and so, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan. <laughs> Put it that good, way. good. I'm, I'm going to make a, uh, an executive call here and our, our, um, Wade has not been a part of the show up to this point and I know we're at the top of the hour. So I'd like to get him in to say hello to you and, and to meet you. And I'm sure he's got a litany of, of, of fast firing questions or at least comments that he'd like to chime in with. So I'm going to step out and it was a pleasure meeting you. And, nice to uh, you too. I'll, yeah. And I'll bring, and we'll bring Wade on into the show. Dan, right. should, we, should we bring him back after a commercial? Or That's, or well, not? there he is. Hello. Hi, Wade. <laughs> hey there. And uh, thank you so much. So since we are at the top of the hour, those loyal fans who tune in each week know we very often go over time. But in the interest of um, courtesy to you, is that something you're open and willing to do uh, sure. tonight is to stay on a little bit longer? Yeah, no problem. I, I, I'm, I've just been fascinated. I've resisted any urge to jump in because I'm just loving hearing you articulate 
as Jacqueline referenced earlier, uh, many of the things that that we and I'm sure many of our listeners have been feeling and thinking, but um, unable really to even articulate it, and even more so, even more so, with that with that element of you know self loathing that was introduced, because all of us. Going back to that moment you referred to in 2012, I believe it was, when suddenly it became about race when it wasn't, and the dominant drumbeat of white equals evil. And I can tell mm -hmm. you, I felt it much more strongly because if there's one thing more evil than being white, it's being a white male, right? Yeah. And <laughs> you referenced, um, and then a conservative hetero white male of all things, right? Yeah, but one, one who maybe does have empathy, you know, and maybe one who does have a certain degree of intelligence and spirituality to suddenly be painted with that brush. And for me, I can tell you that my initial reaction to this was, you know, I deserve it because even if I have never been a racist, I could see that those who were different from me were disadvantaged and uh, had experienced racism. And so it was helpful to me, I thought, to experience a little bit of it now and then, right? It was helpful to me. And, um, but now as a father of a little white boy, I can tell you, I feel very, very differently about that. So um, we are gonna go quickly to a commercial break. And then when we come back, um, I want to, you know, ask a few questions and get you to share a little bit more about your perspectives. Um, okay. We're going to just quickly share one more of the anthologies um, that um, Something or Other Publishing produces. This one has to do with um, giving women their voice. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Sasha Stone. And one of the questions that I've been meaning to ask since the very beginning, when you mentioned Topanga and where you came from in your childhood was Joni Mitchell and Ladies of the Canyon. I mean, that's what I thought of um, as you were mentioning that. So was your was your mother sort of in that world? And, and what was that like growing up as a child uh, in that in that phase, in that hippie uh, era? You know, just going back to your roots on that. Well, it was, um, it was, you know, we were really poor. Uh, we, we lived in an incredible house on top of a mountain. I mean, it's just amazing. They have like three mansions on that same mountain now, but, um, so like the Joni Mitchell, you know, a part of, of Topanga and, you know, Neil Young and Bob Dylan and all those guys and Charles Manson, you know, we're all sort of hanging around <laughs> that era. Um, what it really was, this, the strange thing about growing up then was, um, and that this perhaps explains why we're in the mess we're in today, which is that parents, you know, they didn't really want to be parents. They wanted to be me generation. They wanted to be living their best lives and kids were not treated the way that they are today. They weren't coddled. We weren't coddled as, as everybody my age knows, <laughs> right? We didn't even wear seat belts. It's like, <laughs> uh, we were uh, second, do secondhand stuff. smoke, um, asthma and, um, yeah, yeah. And, 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 you know, we were, we, we played outside until dark, we hitchhiked, you know, 
we didn't have the kind of protections and that's probably why i'm such a i was such a sort of a coddling helicopter mom to my own kid you know i wanted to do that and so you know that's another reason why these things go in cycles um but you know i think that i think that that upbringing for me was wonderful in a lot of ways because you know i had such a you know connection to the natural world and you know i mean a little bit of grit makes you a stronger person hopefully um so yeah i mean i don't I, I spent a lot of years complaining about my childhood in therapy and sort of letting that define me um as a poor abused sad person but you know i've come out of it now after all these years and really just grateful that my mom held it together you know that she was there as much as she was and well you know, I, just see I, it differently. yeah I, I i could empathize a lot with when you were talking about how you came out of it for me um i, I grew up in some ways in a similar way i've documented this in my own work um my trilogy starting with the people of the sign, but it was like a mirror image of what you experienced. And my conversion, if you will, was very quick. My mother was an alcoholic. Um, I was kidnapped in a domestic kidnapping, smuggled out of the country. Um, my mother later succumbed to her alcoholism. But the, the reason I bring this up is I was, I was on a very, you know, free, dark, nihilistic path, drugs and so on, alcohol. Um, but at age 19, I was in a high speed chase up in Alaska with the state troopers in pursuit, uh, ran off the road at 120 miles an hour and survived miraculously. Won't go into the details of it. But at that moment, I realized I could turn my life around. And so I had that 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 experience that you described much later, much more gradually at that moment and then have been more on the conservative side, the religious side most of my life. But my, but my goal is very similar to you or to yours, which is to, to get, get a perspective out there that we must somehow listen to the other side. We must look at both sides, this independent investigation of the truth idea that you've articulated so well is central to this, to this program here created in the image of God. And our view of religion here is that it must inspire and not be coercive, right? And you've described a very coercive situation in the religion on the left, which is what drew us to that blog about emerging from a cult. So I'd like to, with that sort of backdrop and sharing, I'd like to ask you um, to compare the religion that you emerged from with the religion that you are just beginning to explore in in the reading of the bible you mentioned you were drawing some value there and at one point you mentioned you wish you would have taken your daughter to church to at least expose her to that so if you wouldn't mind diving into that a little bit more what what your current thinking is and how that's emerging for you yeah i mean first of all what a life that you've had and you know it's the kind of life that I worry that young people growing up now would never like you were just tumbling through experiences real life experiences and I don't know what what are people going to do now that they're living their lives virtually how are they going to have experiences like that that shape them and make them more wise and and teach them how to appreciate life more and it makes you a an expansive person you know and that's what I worry is missing for kids today I just wish they'd all get off the internet <laughs> but um yeah, I mean, I've had some, I would would be lying if I said I didn't have very, very dark days in the last three years, rock bottom days, some days where I'm never a suicidal person. I've always been a hard worker. I wake up every day at five and I work hard every day. I got that from my mom. My father was put in an, a mental institution when I was a toddler for, um, you know, and given shock therapy back in the 60s. And he never really fully recovered from that. Wow. And so, yeah, it was, it was a hard thing to live with, but I loved my dad and, um, and he died just before, just in 2018. And so all these things were happening to me, a really close friend of mine overdosed on heroin. He was one of the few people that I could really talk to. Another friend of mine that I loved died, uh, suddenly from a heart attack and my daughter left. And, you know, I just felt like, everything had emptied out for me. I had nothing left. I didn't have any friends anymore. Um, everybody online hated me. My mother treated me like she didn't know me anymore and, and couldn't talk to me anymore. I mean, she talks to me, but she 
she's just a very much a Trump hater type person. And so if I even try to talk at all in any sort of balanced way, she gets upset and hangs up. So I had some days where I would wake up and I felt like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. I want to die. I just want out. I cannot live another day with this. I have nothing left to live for. My daughter doesn't want to be around me anymore because she's moved and having her own life. So I thought this is when you turn to God. That's what God is for. And, you know, I was trying to understand that as somebody who was raised as an atheist and never believed in Santa or the Easter bunny or anything. And I just thought I'm never going to be able to turn off my pragmatic mind and, and do this. But Father Mike is such an entertaining, I don't know if you guys have listened to that um, podcast, but he's just such a warm and wonderful voice. And so I would reach for him every night before I go to bed. I just listen to, he starts at the beginning, he reads the whole Bible. And I found that it helped because I, I just thought I can, I, you know, I have to just try this. And so I listened to him and, and it, it gave me something to look forward to when I went to sleep. So I wasn't so terrorized and scared and, and little by little, I started to understand that thing, that need for, for that sort of love that you walk, you know, people who are religious go through life with and how important that is. Um, and how you turn, you, you leave all the big stuff up to somebody who's a higher power, you know, and, and I'm, <laughs> look, I don't know anything about it honestly so, but i just know that for me it was it really was just a last reach for something that would keep me alive well i, I will share then the in that high speed chase um when, when i got out of jail <laughs> um <laughs> which was which was only one night thankfully because i was underage and my dad got me out but um i went back to the scene of me exiting the road and there in black and white on the black pavement where the brakes had been, you know, hit at about a hundred miles an hour. Um, and then in white on the other side where I had gone over an embankment and landed in the snow in between the black and the white was a light pole, which was standing untouched. And I literally walked around and around and around that thing. <clears throat> and it was like a fake arrow through the head kind of thing. There was no way I survived. The car was untouched. It was, and I knew at that moment that somehow miraculously God had spared my life. And it wasn't the kind of thing that I wanted to go tell anybody else about. First of all, no one would believe me. And secondly, mm -hmm. it was a deeply personal thing that was only for me. And it was the fact that this occurred when I was not being a good boy. Right? I was, mm -hmm. I had the state troopers in pursuit. And oh. that's when this miraculous intervention happened. And it was a one time only get out of jail free card. And it was God's love in that moment because I deserved to be shown his love in that moment, not because of anything I did, but because I had mm. not had access to it. I had not been given that in my childhood. It was a one-time show. Look, here I am. And I love you despite yourself. You're your own worst mm -hmm. enemy. And I don't care. I love you. That, that moment turned my life around. Um, mm. and, and the rest of my life was, of course, spent trying, in a sense, to be worthy of that love, even though inherently we are worthy of that love. But we, we, we want to respond and, and, and give it back, right? Um, but it's interesting that it is, to your point, in those dark days. Dan Sampson earlier referenced wisdom. There's this, there's this scripture that says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Of course, nobody understands that word fear. Um, I want to I want to get it in, get into that word fear here in a minute in a broader sense with regard to some of the things you've shared. But I'd like to just get your reaction to that little piece right now and see if that resonates at all with where you're at. Um, you mean what you just told me your story? Yeah, the whole the whole in that moment of darkness or or as as Paul McCartney saying, you know, in our hour of darkness, there is still a light that shines, shine until tomorrow, let it be. You know, his words in that song are when all the broken hearted people living in the world agree, there will be an answer. 
let it be. Mm. And we've talked about the division in this nation. The fact that we can't even talk to each other. The fact that, that when you try to be reasonable and say, hey, they're people too. And this is maybe why they're saying this or why they're acting. Somebody will blow up and accuse you of things, right? Um, they're brokenhearted too. They're brokenhearted about the direction of the nation, just like the people on the other side are brokenhearted about the direction of the nation, but they can't reach agreement on anything. Yeah. And I, I have to admit that I, in, in the darkest days of 2020, when I, this is going to be a strange story, but first of all, your story is beautiful. And thank you for sharing that with me. It really, I found it to be very moving. Um, the, uh, I was watching, you know, to get to know Trump world, I was watching uh, all five of Trump's rallies um, every day. He was doing them in the lead up to the election. He did five of them a day. And I don't know, people don't know his supporters like I came to know them. And a lot of them are very much people of faith or Christians. And that sort of was the thing that bound them together. And they, you know, they, Trump, like you say, someone who, who's not deserving necessarily of the love, but they brought him into that, you know, into their love. And, and honestly, for me, coming out of a world of hate and spending time with, with this group of people, I could feel their love too. And I, and it felt good to me. And, and so I, I found that I would look forward to those rallies. I would look forward to feeling happy and feeling good and feeling accepted and feeling part of something, even though I was just sitting at home watching on my computer, I wasn't there with them. They didn't know who I was or anything, but I could feel that. And I, I wish that there was a way and I think probably eventually, once we're all brought to our knees as a country, which is what the fourth turnings are usually about, that's when people start to find their way back to each other and they, they can find something that we could all unify together. You know, it used to be that we're all Americans and that unified us. We were all tied together by this invisible thread. And Christianity was a huge part of that. If you drive across the country, that's all you see are churches everywhere. And, and so much a part of our country, yet it's been so left behind. And it seems like what we really need is, you know, in a way to bring it all, my friends on the left would just laugh at me hearing me say this, but, you know, just as a way to sort of, I don't know, maybe, maybe a person of faith in, in power who could help us all find a way to unite again that way. I don't know. You know a lot better than I do about this subject. <clears throat> well, and I, I'm I'm going to go ahead and, and show a comment here um, from Humble Thinker, uh, who's dis discussing the other aspect of that, right? Um, cult or Puritans, it's the right. So this is an expression of that. And, and this is the world we live in. Um, I don't know to what degree it was shared with you. Both Jacqueline and I are Baha'is. Um, I don't know if that means anything to you, but one one thing that it means that is always shared is that it is about unity. It is about oneness. It is about um, being able to listen to all sides of an issue. It, you know, it kind of, it evokes the old um, sort of, this may be a cultural appropriism here, you know, a powwow in which everyone sits <laughs> around in a circle and everyone gets to have a voice, you know, and the peace pipe is passed around or the conch shell. Everyone gets to have their turn at having their say. And everyone in the circle has to listen to that and has to respect it and discuss it with, with, with love and concern. Even if you violently disagree, that, that person has a voice, a seat at the table. And, and one of the most fascinating things to me is, is how it is so hard for people to see that they are violating that principle while having identified with it their whole life. And I think as I listen to you, I, I feel like the darkness comes from, you know, having, having seen the hollow, the shallowness of that supposed belief, that profession of faith, or you might say the deep hypocrisy of the core value that one held to on the, on the liberal side. Mm. Yes, absolutely. And what, you know, it wasn't always this way. Remember back in the day when people like Bill Clinton or whatever, they had to at least sort of pay some lip service to the fact that they were people of faith. And even though Joe Biden is also supposedly that, what they have now is a thing where you have to 
go along with everything they, and if you don't, you are severely punished and exiled. But what that thing is, is this, this strange new way of seeing each other in categories defined by our skin color or gender or whatever it is. And um, it's the opposite of unifying. It's, it's separating us out. You know, my daughter was, her best friend was black. We, she came of age with only knowing Bo Obama as her president. And she was put in this high school where it was almost like they had to fill her up with the idea of racism, which she didn't right. have before that. And I just thought, what, what is this? What's going on? <laughs> you know, um, I know I haven't heard of that, what you're talking about. Um, uh, the only thing it kind of reminds me of is, have you ever heard of way of counsel? Reminds me a little of that where people would sit in a circle, they called it way of counsel and they would talk, you know, one person would talk right. and everybody faced each other. And, and that, that I do have some experience with. Yeah, in the in the Baha'i faith, it's called consultation. But but yes. Mm -hmm. So Jacqueline, you looked like you had a, a question or a thought that you wanted to introduce. Oh, I just wanted to point out to people who are watching and particularly humble thinker. I really recommend Sasha's article that we've been referencing. Did I just leave a cult? And we put the link in the chat. I just wanted to highlight. Well, thank you. So I wanted to now get back to this question that I or this topic I mentioned a few minutes ago about fear. Because one of the things that's been fascinating to me is I, I come from actually a fundamentalist. So when I, after that experience, I, I, I left Alaska where, where I was living. And by the way, I was in a tent in Alaska my senior year. And so to your point about, you know, being exposed to um, the realities of life, many times in my life since that senior year when I was tent boy up in Palmer, Alaska, I've looked uh, in a difficult situation in my life and I've had many and I said, you know, I can get through this. It's not the tent. Right. And my fear is, and I see this in my own kids, I I'm a little bit older, but I have young kids, uh, 14 and 12. And what happens is they do have those experiences that you and I had, but they have them online. And then they, mm. what they don't realize is that they have no capacity to do any of this in the real world. They, their, their mind is convinced that they have all these powers, but they don't know the first thing about actually delivering any of those results in the real world. When you think about the most basic of games, you know, coins are raining from heaven instantly the minute you do a few little things, right, in the game. And suddenly you're successful and you're immensely rewarded. And I, and I see this particularly in my son where he's almost incapacitated when the real world doesn't respond like that. And as a, as a boy, you know, I, I remember those feelings of, of inadequacy and incompetence and impotence when, you know, my life was crashing around me. I had an alcoholic mother and I, you know, couldn't, didn't know how to take care of myself. Um, but I, but I, through, through much hard work, I overcame that. I didn't have parents that sort of trained me and taught me. It was a school of hard knocks and it comes with a lot of baggage, but we're not preparing our children to deal with the real world. And if, if ever, you know, the internet goes down yeah. or, you know, or there's not something at the local store, which, you know, you could you use your, you use your parent funded credit card to get an Uber with. Right. You are really SOL. Um, so my, my, I'm, I'm off on a tangent now. But what I wanted to bring up in this issue of fear is that um, I, I went into the direction of, of a fundamentalist religion that took the Bible literally. And so we studied things mm -hmm. like the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. And, um, you know, they were rampaging across humankind with war and pestilence and famine and false religion, you know, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. But it, it began to occur to me in, an, in the most amazing way that science has literally assumed the role of the wild-eyed prophet of doom, right? Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the same four horsemen of, of the apocalypse, right? It's brought to your world through the technology, but it's emphasized whether it was, in fact, climate change, right? The sun getting 10 times hotter, it talks about in the book of Revelation. Climate change, which will bring famine and pestilence and rising seas and floods and all mm. the mercurial lightning bolts from an angry divine God. Science is now the one that's telling us that these things are coming after us. And with the pandemic and the extreme fear and the ongoing lockdowns, 
far beyond the point where any sane, rational person could look out and see it's nowhere near as bad as they claimed it would be. So what are your thoughts on that? Why is that from a cultural uh, perspective that we that we kind of almost want that profit to, to threaten us? But now it's science that's doing that. And, 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 and how does that play out? Well, I know, because I was one of those people, I really genuinely believe that. And it took, you know, Michael Schellenberger and other writers um, talking about it to, to make me see things a little bit differently, where climate is concerned. But what, you know, what disturbs me is this idea that, that the pharmaceutical companies really do want to tell people that they can't survive without them. They can't survive without some sort of prescription or, or medication for life. And I managed to keep my daughter out of that mess. But when she became a young adult, all these ads were bombarding her and telling her she had ADHD and she had to go on Adderall. And, right. and the only big fight we ever had was over that. And I said, look, they just want to hook you for life. Don't do it. And I've never talked to her about it since because it's her business. But that right. creeps me out a lot. I, I just wanted to say one thing to Humble Thinker who had said that he felt the same way I did, but he came from the right. I just want to say that what I understand about this time we're living in is it's really easy to sell into one kind of ideology and to only see that as the reality. I do see the silo on the right. I'm just not in it, but I appreciate those people and I get along with them, but I see what it is they believe. And I see the kind of news, if they only pay attention to that side of the news, then they're going to have a separate reality from the people on the left who only have, and, and these two sides mirror each other in really strange ways but the fact that they're dehumanizing each other and they're hating each other, that's really where I think the danger comes in. But I absolutely understand what he's talking about. I don't really see myself of the left or the right anymore. My politics really haven't changed. But right. When you, you know, left one, Cal, you didn't immediately jump into another one is what you're saying. Yeah. Trying, trying not to. Uh, yeah, because now I'm, I'm, I'm hip to the game, you know, and I, I know what it feels like to get wrapped up in headlines that tell you what you want to hear. You know, if you only spend time on Truth Social or Getter or stuff like that, then you're going to silo into to a, a bubble. But is um, that part of the uh, is that part of the darkness and the dis, the uh, despair that you've that you described as feeling in that? If you, you know, so such large percentages of America today are deeply entrenched in these separate echo chambers with self-referential belief systems, mm -hmm. which lock them in, you know, Leonard Cohen, and you'll, you'll notice I refer to music because you mentioned films, but for me, it was always music and the lyrics. Le Leonard Cohen said, you know, there is a crack in everything in his song Anthem. There's a crack in everything. That's, That's how, how the light, the light, gets, light in. gets in. <laughs> I love that it's, song. Yeah, exactly. Um, the holy dove will be bought again, bought and sold and bought again. The dove is never free. Mm. People try to control that and, 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 and insist on the orthodoxy of their belief system. The divine message is corrupted by those who claim to believe in it, who insist and coerce a rigid belief system rather than inspiring others to seek the source of that truth. Yeah. I, I love that song and I love waiting for the miracle of his. I think that's just a really great song too. Very, very uh, poignant, meaningful. I think that what happened on the left, as far as I could tell was that we were building a utopia on the left and we believed that we were the good Puritans and we had this, paradise we'd built and that when one it disrupted it and all we've been doing since then is is at this level 10 catastrophe where everything is a dire emergency a crisis and, and it is that way on the right too to a degree but on the left it's more like you're saying like it's climate change it's you know a, a breaking news story and they and they cycle through these these uh 24 hour hysteria fits and, you know, I don't know how humans survive that long, especially, I mean, our country, especially if the people that are in charge are the people who keep losing their minds over these imagined uh, crises that, that are, all they really want is their utopia back, but it's never coming back, right? It's over. Well, as a, as a, you know, deeply religious person, I remain that my whole life, though, though I, though I continue to be a seeker, even, even as a declared Baha'i, 
I continue to seek. I continue to keep an open mind and independently investigate the truth. Um, and nonetheless, I recognize that I am not God. I recognize that there is a higher power out there. But if if one doesn't have that, right, there's ultimately an emptiness and a, and a hollowness at the core. So would would you perhaps agree, I'm not trying to push this on you, but for you to reflect on, would you agree that when when that culture that you talked about that was always the counterculture, right, that was always the one standing looking at those who were dominant and who claimed to have all the boxes checked, right? They were right with God. They represented God. They were doing God's work. You know, America was a godly nation, blah, blah, blah. And these people on the counterculture sort of mirroring back, well, you've got this flaw. You've got that flaw. You're hypocrites here. You're hypocrites there. The more, yeah. the more somebody on the right would stand up and declare, this is what I represent, the easier is it, it is to say, but you're, you're just a human being. And look, I see all these warts on you, right? So mm -hmm. my point is, when 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 the side that didn't declare to be based in that solid divine you know partnering with god space um became ascendant um one one then sees that it's actually empty and hollow without a submission to that divine source and the only way to maintain the momentum is to have an enemy to fight against and to mm. you know point to the heretics to point, you know, to even go after the little children who are saying, but mommy, that emperor is actually naked, right? right. That Because it's the little children that actually see the truth. And if, and, and they're the ones who can come up and expose this thing um, potentially, because all to your point, all the adults are terrified of speaking their mind. Yeah. I mean, I, I one of these books, there's another book on um, the pendulum theory. It's actually, called Pendulum, How Generations of the Past, uh, ex something like p explain our present and predict our future, something like that. But they talk about how at this particular moment in time is probably the time when people ju just give up and they drift because of what you're talking about, because there isn't that, what did you call it, access to the source. There isn't a, a spiritual component to this movement. I mean, there's a rapture, right? They feel like they've discovered the secrets to human, you know, to 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 life, right? That they, they know it's all based on identity, gender, and this and that, whatever it is. But they're missing, like you say, that infusion. Um, and so, like, what he's saying is they'll just give up and they'll just wander, and then eventually it'll all have to start rebuilding itself again after the fourth turning. Look, I mean, how long has Christianity been around? Like, <laughs> this is religion is not going anywhere. Um, it's, it's, you know, the new ones that crop up now and again, or the cults or whatever they are, they don't last because they don't have any uh, tradition to them. And so I think that's why people keep, so I don't think it's, in other words, I don't think we're living through the end of religion at this moment, even though people's uh, faith in God is diminishing by poll numbers. Uh, and especially with young people. But I think in the end, people keep coming back to it because, I mean, there are other religions that people believe in that, that give them the same fulfillment, but they tend to be traditional religions. And I think people return to them because eventually that is like what I went through. It's the only answer left, you know? Well, I, I've I've um, had my fair share of sort of firing these elaborate questions at you but i want to i want to now return the mic to jacqueline and i don't know if, if um daniel also has something to say because i was just so just in love with the conversation that you and jacqueline were having the way jacqueline was bringing out your your thoughts um and and i just love to you know take this conversation back there as we as we reach probably the end of our um overtime time and make sure that um, Jacqueline has a chance to round this out with with her remaining thoughts. And and I'll just say it's been such an honor having you on the show. And I really hope you'll you, you've had enough of a good time here to be willing to come join us again. Oh, I absolutely would, and I I will do video next time so that you can at least see my facial expressions because it must be really strange just talking to a blank screen. Well, yeah. And hey, Daniel, where's that little um you know visual? I don't know. Um, 
what went wrong there. <clears throat> well, we what had, I'm we doing had... is I'm I'm anticipating that Wade's going to step out of the room, and I'm going to give Jacqueline full screen, and I don't want to put her. I don't want to put a a Sasha Stone tattoo on the forehead of Jacqueline Claire. So we're going to <laughs> say goodbye to Wade. We're going to give Jacqueline the stage, and it's just going to be the two of you to close out uh, this conversation. All right, it's been a pleasure, Wade. Thank you we'll for, see you for soon, a Sasha. wonderful conversation. Okay, sounds good. Yes, I echo all of that. Sasha, it was really fun getting to know you bef before the show, uh, familiarizing myself with your content, and it was great having you on. Um, is there anything, any last thoughts that you would like our viewers to leave with? Um, no, I just I I enjoyed the conversation. It was it was very illuminating in ways that I found surprising and interesting. So it's given me a lot to think about. Um, and I, I appreciate you giving me this chance to get to know you um, and hear what you think as well. Thank you. Well, how can people find you? I know we, we had your emblem the whole show, so you guys, you, you hopefully caught it there, but I'm sure you have other places people can find you. So where are your preferred methods for people to follow your content and follow, you know, your, your daily, your, you know, your thoughts that you put out regularly? Um, well, I am on Twitter, but I have a, I have a lockdown account because of online abuse. So, uh, uh, but if you want to find me there, I'm, Real Sasha Stone, and uh, my Substack is sashastone.substack.com, where my essays are. And that's where you could find the link to my podcast, um, and that's pretty much it. I don't really use Facebook anymore, or I have Instagram, but it's also locked down. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think Substack's probably the best place. So okay, right on. So it's Sasha Stone Substack. Yes, just yeah, Seven. probably the cool. easiest way is through Google. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you for doing what you're doing, narrating this time in history and being a bridge for people. Well, thank you for having me on your show. This is very exciting and it, it definitely lifted my mood for the night. So thank you. Awesome. Yeah. And, and that was something at the, the loneliness of walking this path, you know, speaking out with courage and being willing to go against the grain and, you know, it sounds like you're, you're feeling some of the weight of that. And I think that uh, you're very vocal about it, but I think everyone who's walking that path and opening their eyes feels that. And it's, it's too bad. And I, and I, but I hope on some spiritual ethereal level, like we can feel the, the support of all the other souls out there, like walking in those front lines. So mm. I, yes, I'm glad that you're uplifted from this. And I hope that it it's another, it filled your gas tank, you know? It absolutely did. It really did. Thank you so much. Right on. Well, we're going to close out the show. And I, thanks to Soup Publishing, we're giving another copy of my book away, my children's spiritual handbook called noble beings so um i think i'm going to pick a comment from tonight who will get a copy of the book so am sterling one if you could write uh info at soup publishing and give them your address. We will send you a copy of my book. And I think we're going to cut to some uh, ads for my book and maybe next week. And we will see you guys next Tuesday on Created in the Image of God. Thank you, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Bursting with joy on every page. An illustrated handbook of spiritual truths help children learn lifelong gems of guidance, who we truly are, how to live, how to pray, how to treat others. Enjoyed by children and families around the world, inspiring meaningful conversations, powerful self-images, good habits, devotion, courtesy, truthfulness, Friendship, Noble Being Spiritual Handbook for Children of All Ages, a special collection of wisdom from the Baha'i Writings 
illustrated by spiritual realism painter Jacqueline Clare, empower children of all ages to be the noble beings they are meant to be. Available in hardback, paperback, and ebook on Amazon. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It's been such a pleasure having Sasha Stone with us here tonight. I just wanted to mention next week, we have a very special guest planned. If we can get him, he's uh, hailing from Israel. And this is a gentleman that I met when I was there recently in January, visiting the site of the uh, City of David archeological expedition where I was as a college student unearthing Zion. And his name is Alan Rabinowitz. He is a tour guide and archeologist. So we hope to dig deep into history and talk about the uniqueness of uh, biblical archeology span with Alan Rabinowitz on next week's show. So thank you everyone for joining us. It's been a pleasure and uh, A.M. Sterling, get us your info. We'll get you Jacqueline's book. We'll see you all next week. Thank you, Jackie, for an, an amazing show tonight.